My name is Paul Holden. I'm the President and CEO here at the Birmingham Board of Trade and uh, welcome um, to uh, the, the second of our events uh, with George and, and this time we're looking at attracting more uh, B2B customers uh, using digital marketing strategies. Um, so before we start, I'd just like to take a moment to recognise that we, or at least where we are in the office here, are on the traditional homeland of the Hunkaminam and Skohomish speaking peoples and we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to hold a meeting on this territory. Um, so in the event today, George, uh, uh, who's the founder of Kirk Communications, George Affleck, will share his thoughts and experience for finding, nurturing and converting leads in today's marketplace. He's going to be sharing his proven step-by-step -step marketing and sales process that puts nurturing and closing on autopilot so you can focus on building and scaling your business for the long term. And he's going to be highlighting what your business should consider and plan for when undertaking your own marketing efforts. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to thank our annual partners, who are those organizations who stand out as top cor cor uh, corporate citizens in Burnaby um, and uh, support our work throughout the year. And you can see their logos on the screen there now. So um, we'd just like to thank uh, all of those organizations for the fantastic work they do in supporting us and supporting the community uh, throughout the year. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker now. So we're going to get underway. Um, if you have any questions, please enter those in the Q&A se uh, section at the bottom of your screens, and uh, we'll save a few minutes at the end to answer any questions that you have. Um, the session is, as you probably all realize, uh, being recorded. Uh, today, I'm pleased to be joined by George Affleck, founder and president of Curve Communications Group, uh, a longstanding Burnaby Water Trade member, and a digital marketing agency assisting marketing teams in reaching their clients' high-level aspirational goals. Uh, he launched his company in 2000, and since then he's worked as the agency of record for local government organizations, nonprofit associations, uh, and private sector clients in retail, banking, manufacturing, aerospace, oil and gas, uh, software, uh, blockchain technology, healthcare, construction, real estate, education, environment, automotive, travel, HR, sales, and many more. I'm not sure there's many more left there, George. I think you've got most of them covered off. So I'm going to hand over to you now, George, and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation today. And just remember, everybody, put any questions in the chat room that you that come up, and we'll get to them as we go through the presentation. So thanks, George. Over to you. Thanks, Paul. I'm just going to... Can everybody see that? Saying hello? Can you see that? Everybody's good? Cool. Uh, so hi, I'm George. Thanks, thanks for uh, attending today. And uh, today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, B2B marketing. And I was here last month talking about uh, B2C marketing and uh, so it's a slightly different approach as you well know if you're a business to business owner. Uh, Curve Communications as Paul mentioned um, is a uh, based in Vancouver uh, but we have a lot of clients in Burnaby actually that's why we're a member of the Burnaby Board of Trade. We're, we're a full service agency we've been around for 20 years. Uh, we're focused uh, our approach has always been focused on um, getting the best ROI, getting driving leads, but also focused on ROI on the return on investment. So really tracking those leads, tracking the, the, the value of those leads uh, and uh, ensuring that uh, clients are getting the best dollar or bang for their buck, as it were. Our clients quite often uh, treat us as their entire marketing team, especially in the B2B sector, uh, where we have, uh, for example, a marketing director or a sales director that we work with, and they quite often outsource us as the entire marketing team and so because they can access uh, us in many different ways um, we have uh, we have all these skills in-house and then we outsource some of things but mostly we can do all of these different things in-house uh, for our clients so it makes it a lot easier for our clients to be able to know that they have one call does it all uh, and we can uh, provide them with the best strategy and then implementation possible it's a it's certainly in these days uh, especially with a lot of our clients being in industrial uh, areas where they have getting access to talent when there's not a lot of talent out there, especially prior to the pandemic. But even now, finding good uh, marketing people is tough. Believe me, I know that because I'm trying to find them all the time, uh, especially ones that are skilled in multiple areas as far as, you know, knowing how to do Google and Facebook and social and uh, traditional advertising and web builds and web, you know, and uh, content and all those different things, video production, that's not an easy person to find. And uh, so quite often for the, per for the value of one staff member, we take care of pretty much everything for a lot of these manufacturing and products companies we work with. So uh, the, um, 
So today we're talking about, you know, are you a business doing business with other businesses? That's obviously what we're here for today. Uh, a lot of people that we talk to are worried about marketing their marketing. It's not optimized for sales uh, of their product or service. I'll be talking about pro products and services throughout this. Um, so I'll try to just differentiate <clears throat> between the two as much as I can. We do both uh, for B2B. We do products and services. So whether it be an accounting firm or a manufacturing company that makes torque wrenches. Uh, some of the, most of the approaches are quite similar. Obviously the sales cycle and this and the slightly end part is different, but that's kind of where the client takes off from there. So uh, for the purposes of today, I've broken it into what I call the R formula. I don't know why this happened, but there seems to be a ton of the letter R in my, uh, in my presentation and in what we do. Uh, and so I've broken it down to three key ones for today's purposes uh, to help you uh, uh, efficiently create a marketing system that converts into sales. Uh, so the first is being reputation, uh, the second being reach, and the, and the third being results. So uh, in the last year and a half, I think we all know the world has changed, especially when it comes to BTB marketing. Uh, this is me in 2019 at a trade show in uh, Barcelona, actually, for a client. We went there uh, to uh, look at some products and things like that. And, uh, and that was the last trade show I was at um, because soon into the new year, uh, the trade show world came to a, a halt and a lot of our business to business clients rely on trade shows, uh, to show off their wares, to show off their services. And so suddenly they had no trade shows and they had nowhere to, uh, do their usual schmoozing and hanging out. Uh, and that became a real challenge for them, especially if they weren't up to the level that they needed to be on the digital side. So what we had to do is really pivot those clients that we worked with, especially the ones that weren't completely uh, uh, embedded in a digital strategy uh, as far as the life cycle of a client. We had to teach them and work with them on connecting with clients and find how uh, leads, uh, you know, find those leads without leaving home or without leaving the office. In the case, most of us working from home over the last year uh, and then somehow build trust uh, with uh, uh these clients, these potential leads without buying a beer at the bar or martini or going for dinner. Uh, the trade show circuit is not just about the trade show. It, it sort of epitomizes that kind of relationship, trust building and uh, atmosphere. And uh, whether it's at a trade show or taking people out for lunches or that connecting with people is really tough to do virtually, I think. And so people were really challenged by that. And so how do I do this? How do I make somebody trust me? Uh, without uh, really connecting with them in a, in a traditional way. And some companies are further ahead of, on this than others. Um, but this last year and a half, just like this Zoom call we're doing right now is a perfect example of how we connect. This might have been a, a live event before. And now we've pivoted, uh, the Burnaby Board of Trade has pivoted to doing this kind of uh, virtual event uh, and uh, for relationship building and trust and set, showing off different things uh, for businesses. So, uh, so we really have to focus on new, uh, how to use digital marketing and the technology for sales. Uh, that was what was required. We, we knew that uh, traveling and, and, and lunches were done. Uh, we didn't know for how long, whether it would be a few months, a year, two years. Now we're heading into almost year two of uh, this world we've been living in. Uh, in the B2B world. And so a lot of companies have managed to make this transition and others uh, are still struggling. For us, uh, most of our, uh, well, all of our B2B clients, our, our B2C clients definitely were more challenged, I think, uh, uh, because of people coming in person and eating at restaurants or whatever. Um, in the case of B2B, all of our clients actually saw an increase in revenue in this past year uh, and saw sales go up which is very interesting. And uh, this is a quote from Churchill. If you're going through hell, keep going. This last year perhaps has felt like hell, but you gotta just kind of persevere. Uh, and there's ways to do this that will, uh, I think, you know, we've proven to be effective for these clients. And really now it's a matter of them sticking with the program that we've created for them while also potentially adding in the, the traditional stuff they used to do uh, before the pandemic uh, hit. And now they'll have two ways of really, uh, nurturing and growing those uh, those leads. So the four the, the our formulas are reputation, reach, results. The first one is is reputation, and and this is really a focused on, you know, what your customers say and what others say about your product or service. I think we all know this, and reputation. I think everybody really 
most business owners understand this is important. What they quite often don't understand is the process, um, you know, I'm just going to close this window here, uh, that uh, you go through. And this is, you know, you get events, whether it's your clients, whether it's through events, whether it's through referrals, whether it's through traditional advertising or websites, email, SMS, Google, social media, all these different ways. Sometimes you assume, uh, and we find this certainly the case with B2C customers, but B2B customers as well, that there's an assumption that goes straight from there to a sale. Well, you know that before they make that decision, they check out your reputation, whether it's on your own website, which you make sure that your website's properly built out and got the proper tools and, and website uh, and information, uh, testimonials, videos, all that stuff to prove uh, that you have a great reputation. Social media, they look at your social channels, they check out what people are saying, they'll Google you, they'll look at your GMB, that's your Google My Business page to see what reviews are like. Really, that's a hugely, huge growing area for uh, all businesses uh, to make sure your, your GMB page has really positive reviews and, and you get that four plus star rating. Uh, without that, you're losing a ton of leads and a ton of clients and a ton of business. Uh, other review sites, depending on the business that you're in, it's crucial that you make sure that you're registered on those sites and that you have reviews on those sites and there's positive uh, comments and positive reviews on all those sites. And if there's not, you need to fix that. And of course, references are crucial to uh, any new, uh, any potential lead that you might have uh, before they make the decision. Once you make it through that, uh, check in by, uh, by the, your customers or your leads, uh, then they'll make the decision whether they think, okay, yeah, I trust this company. I'm going to either go to the next step or make the sale or buy the product or move on with the service, or I'm going to contact a competitor, which is the worst thing you want to happen or do nothing. They just say, you know what? I'm fine the way it's going. And so you want to make sure that your, your, your reputation, your brand are really clear and that uh, there's nothing, there's no holes in it. The key with, uh, uh, the, with your customer, and this is what in in the B two B space we call account based marketing. Now, I didn't, I'm not going to get too deep into the account based marketing uh, concept today, but this is basically what we're talking about today. Uh, and and account based marketing is really hyper focused on the customer. It's really saying. Who is my customer and how do I solve their problem? What problem do they have? How do I solve it? How will the business be better after they've bought your product or service? Uh, will it save them time? Will it make them more money, give them more freedom? Uh, and this personal selling with a technological boost is really what I'm you know, going to talk about a lot today. This is account-based marketing. This is when you take, you look at your customer and you target them with content, with uh, anything that you think will make their life better. Quite often, it's a bunch of free stuff that you put out there to build that trust, to create that relationship that you, uh, in a real world at a trade show, you'd be able to do by hanging out. But in the case of a virtual world, you have to do through different means and different ways of uh, giving them what they will make them uh, feel like they can trust you. Uh, the, the key with uh, account-based marketing and B2B marketing in a digital world that we live in, and, and this works and at any time, frankly, but it's something that often we have a challenge with as, a, as an agency with our, our clients is, is the synchronicity between the, the revenue team. The revenue team is made up of your the owner or the CEO or the, or the visionary of the company, the sales team, the marketing team, and then operations, the people who actually do the work, who get the stuff done. It's shocking sometimes how those four areas are not working in sync. They, they're not uh, talking to each other. They don't, they don't, there's not buy-in on the strategy and approach. Uh, even between sometimes the sales team and the marketing team, there's friction quite often uh, because the approaches that a marketing team might want to take to send leads to the to the sales team uh, aren't getting them. Uh, they don't trust them or they will say, oh, these leads are no good. Uh, I need better leads. Uh, so it's really important that the, the, all these groups talk together and put that plan together. Uh, so what are the sales goals? What's the vision of the company? Where do you want to be in one year and three years and five years? Then this, the marketing and sales team say, okay, how do we get there? Uh, how do we do this together? Uh, how do we send you the leads? How do we build up that leads? How do we give you the systems to convert sales? How do we give you, how do we create the tools that make it possible to make more money? Uh, and then the operations team have to make sure they don't let you down. <laughs> they have to make sure that they either make the product. And we have some clients where they're having a challenge with the demand being so high that they have a, a six month or so wait on some of their products. And that's a real challenge, but 
uh, it's, I guess it's a nice place to be, but it's not ideal because again, going back to your, to your, uh, to your, um, uh, the reviews that you might get, you don't want people saying negative things out there about you. So it's make sure that all four of these teams, this revenue team is, is synced together uh, on the goals of the company and how you're going to get there. And so creating a discovery document, putting the plan together, transparency with each other, that's key to success for, for in business to business marketing. So the second area is reach. That sort of touches on brand. I think I, I feel like I don't want to get too much into brand. I think you all know and what the unique selling proposition, you know what you're selling. If you can refine that, you can think about how you do that, what's your elevator pitch, all that stuff. I could have got into all that, but I'm going to leave that to you as far as I, I'm going to believe that you understand what it is that you're selling and there's clarity in that. Um, and if you, if you can't say what you're selling in less than 30 20 words, then you need to refine your unique selling proposition. You really need to find out how to get to that customer. And, and it's not, you're not selling your business. You're selling, you're selling to the, you're, you're solving a, a problem for your customer. Uh, and you always have to remember that everything you do, everything you put out there, it's about solving their problem. Uh, it's not about bra bragging about yourself. It's, it's about helping them, the customer uh, with your solution or product or service. So reach is pretty broad, uh, than an R word, but there's lots of aspects of reach. And this really gets into how do we get more people into your funnel, into you, how do you get more leads and how do you convert those leads using some of the new techniques that we, we've been using over the last year and a half. First you need, uh, and I know this is painful for a lot of people, especially sales guys, uh, because they really, uh, a CRM, a customer relationship management system is key to this. Uh, a Google Sheet's great or an Excel spreadsheet's great, but it doesn't, come with the stuff that really makes this sing uh, in this new world we live in, which is an automation. Uh, CRM uh, can be great as far as, you know, tracking your sales lead and all that stuff. And if you're, it's, but it's only as good as the information that goes into it. Uh, and then if you have automation attached to it, uh, you got to trust this robot. It's pretty amazing. I just kind of a joke, but it's really the, the technology that's evolving right now in CRMs and automation is, I mean, it's, as an agency, it's really tough to sometimes keep up with what's next. We have some software that we're using and it's pretty amazing, uh, especially in the SMS text area, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, but some of the CRMs that are out there, there, there are endless, we're agnostic when it comes to CRM. They're all kind of similar. Salesforce is kind of like the Cadillac of CRMs. Uh, Keep, uh, Monday, HubSpot, SharpSpring is another one we use. That's our, we're a partner in SharpSpring. So who's a sort of a smaller one? You have to be, you have to make sure that you choose the right one that makes sense for you uh, financially as well. They can get quite expensive. Uh, Salesforce alone, I think, can get into the thousands and thousands of dollars. So make sure you're 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 doing your analysis. Um, they're all very similar. Uh, it's really about how you will use them and how your sales team and your marketing team and your uh, your implementation team uh, understand how to use it and and make sure that somebody oversees it. That there's a guru overseeing your CRM. These are some of the things that a CRM that you're looking into should do with automation. It should be, you know, have identity visitor ID. That means when somebody, once somebody's registered through your site that you can track whenever they come back, it's kind of creepy, but you can see when people have been to your website in previous times, you can see where they came from, what business they're at. Even if they haven't actually filled out information, you can actually now track uh, if they're visiting from a business, you can see what business that was. So if you know, uh, that there's somebody who's from X corporations been on your website because you get this little report uh, and you know, okay, well, that's interesting. This person was on my website. I'm going to go phone that company and see if I can, you may not know who the person is, but you should be able to figure it out fairly given what you're selling, who it might be. Uh, although someone on occasion I've done this and with my business and it's somebody who's looking for a job and that doesn't uh, sometimes be uncomfortable, but uh, they're trying to get out of their thing. But uh, in the case of most of what, b2b companies are selling you can figure out pretty quickly who the it's usually operations uh for most b2b sometimes it's a ceo um, but you can usually figure it out pretty quickly and, and then just connect with them and say hey i i know this sounds weird we got some software on our website and you can see or see somebody was visiting there i see that there's somebody on your from your company there uh kind of you know be interested if, if there's anything i can help you with it's really kind of what you can do with some of this uh, automation and this crm software that you can add to your website uh, with CRMs, you can and automation, you can test uh, landing pages, you can test ads, you can test your homepage, you can, you know, all sorts of things can be tested. Forms, different kinds of forms that get filled out. Um, uh, your optimization, your, uh, the tracking, you can you can uh, track, you can score your customers like based on 
uh, various uh, things that are related to that person. So it can be when they come back or you'll know this one's a hot lead because it's an 80 out of 100 or whatever your scoring might be. You get sales notifications when they come back to your website. You'll get an immediate email or text if you want saying, hey, Joe Smith's back on your website. Check him out. And you can reach out right away. Uh, and of course, all this can be mobilized. And then the best part of CRMs and automa automation is really it's about able to optimize and really track your ROI and for, for your accounting team and connecting with your accounting systems and your and your overall goals financially uh, and, and whether, where you're spending your money on advertising. This is really key to knowing where uh, you are on your, on your return on investment on, mar on your marketing spend. You wanna make sure that you're getting the right uh, dollar uh, uh, return on your advertising. I often call it the, uh, uh, how automation can fi fix your leaky bucket. There's so many uh, different ways that uh, you have a leaky bucket that you probably don't even know. For example, uh, so first of all, there's, there's just the whole sales, sales process, which you can understand from a CRM and, and how your salespeople can use this and track. And you can actually, if you're the owner of the company, track your salespeople, put in goals, know how, how, how to reach those goals, see where they're at, see who's a good salesperson, who's a bad salesperson, whatever. Uh, but it's also great for... Um, you know, things like on your website, when people do visit your website, I talked about some of the stuff that you that you can see, but really one of the things that we're just adding to our website right now, like this week is I'm adding, I'm switching from forms to uh, when somebody does fill out a simple form or, and there's a chat widget, it's going to actually text me. I'm the main salesperson at Curve. I don't have a team of 10 people. If you have a team of 10 people, it gets a bit complicated, but I'm now going to get a text saying uh, when somebody starts a chat and I'll be able to have a conversation with this person directly. Um, but with automation, I, when I'm not there, I can create a flow. I can write out a script that says, hey, I'm not here right now. Answer this question. And then you can do the if this, then that with automation. So if a person asks this question, and I'm sure you've all experienced this through various chat things, but it's really, really accessible now for everybody to do this. It's totally doable for the smallest of businesses that you can have this automated text process. We're doing it for, for a lot of our B2C clients, our, our dentists and our, and our um, uh, uh, chiropractors. This automation process is really cool. And texting right now is like the hottest thing you can be doing in marketing. Open rates of most texts that you send out is about 80%. But that's a perfect example of a leaky, you know, hole in your bucket on your website. So you don't have a chat section and you don't have a, what happens when somebody fills out a form, where do they go? What happens to them? Do they end up in this you know, hole? That's not, they don't get a response for a couple of days. The basic philosophy is where you have to respond within a half an hour to any, anybody who fills out a form on your website or starts a chat, there has to be some kind of response either immediately or at least within a half an hour. So, and if you don't, you might lose that client. So you wanna make sure if you can't respond that there's automation and the automation possibilities are pretty amazing as far as what you can create, as far as uh, uh, AI technology uh, and that robot speaking for you. And when the questions get too complicated, uh, then it goes to a real conversation with you. It sends you a warning saying, you know, Mary Jones has asked a question that, you know, uh, you, we don't have an answer for. Can you jump on board now and talk to this person? You can make it work that way. It's pretty amazing. Uh, also, uh, if you're not having got your website set up uh, for re-targeting, re, re, uh, a lot of our clients don't have this, but if you haven't got a widget, and that's like a little bit of software on your website that sends an ad that somebody visits your site, now suddenly they're going to get set, uh, fed an ad every time they're on the Global Mail website or they're on Facebook. They see your brand ad. They see it everywhere. If you don't have that built in, that's a hole that you need to fill. Uh, so there's tons of holes that CRMs and automation can fix uh, on in your process. Uh, it can also making sure you build lists. In Canada, as you know, lists are a real challenge. We can only do so much. Uh, because of the castle uh, the spam laws are super strict in this country, some of the strictest in the world. And so you want your, your email list, your opt-in list is so valuable in Canada. You got to make sure you, you keep building it and keep growing it. And of course, tracking data, as I mentioned, making sure you understand where these customers are coming from and what they're doing um, and how they're spending their money. Uh, just to, you know, I talked earlier about products and services. Um, uh, as I said earlier, there's we have these are some of our clients, Motion Industries, which is based in Burnaby, Rad Torque out in Abbotsford. They're a torque wrench company. Motion's uh, multiple products. We work with about 15 different specific products with them, um, and, and we do all of their across Canada marketing. Um, and then ICBA is a Burnaby-based uh, nonprofit for the Independent Contractors Business Association. 
B2B, but it's a uh, service to, to, uh, to the industry. And so we do their marketing. And then we have an accounting company that we do B2B marketing for. So real diverse. So two kind of B2B for services and two for B2B products. But the systems are still quite similar that we use for all four of these companies. We're doing the same process where we if we get a lead, we put them in a funnel, we start texting them, we talk to them, we do the AI, we have the automation, all those things are key. And it's not very complicated to build. So uh, before you start, uh, you know, so once you've got all that stuff built out, you've got your CRM system, but you filled the holes, you've done, you've got your forms filled, you've got a chat on your site. You don't have to do all this all in the same day, but you can take your time, but try to get most of this done before you start really doing outreach to your customers, because you want to make sure that when you bring in a customer, that they get put into this CRM, into this automation, so that you don't lose them. So you don't lose them through a hole in that bucket. So if you can fill as many of those holes in your bucket before you start uh, reaching out to your customers, that is huge, hugely valuable, and you'll save a ton of money and you'll get more clients and more closes than ever before. So where is your customer? That's really crucial. A lot of clients come to us, oh, well, everyone's our customer. You know, that's, you know, that's not true. But I think if you, you kind of know who your customer is, but it's important to really define them in part because it's for advertising, especially in social media, it's really important to know where they are. And so this is a avatar created by a digital marketer. If you're not a digital marketer, is a great website. Uh, if you ever want to check it out, I think there's a monthly rate. You can they have access to all sorts of cool tools that you can use uh, if you're going to do this yourself. Um, but this is one of the little uh, avatar creator things they have. They have a whole book that comes with this, but this is kind of shows you all these things that the goals of the customer, give the, give the avatar, your customer, a name. I know this seems weird. And a lot of this we do with our clients. They think, oh, this is so dorky. Why do we have to do this? But it really makes a big difference, not only for marketing, but actually for HR and, and your sales guys. Because if you're in this debate, if your CEO is having a conversation with your sales guy and he's making these calls to somebody like, well, well is that Joe or our customer? Is that the cust our customer? You know, let's, let's look at our customer again. Some, some of our clients do a big giant poster on the wall in their sales team's office to remind them of who their customer is. But they also use it for when they're hiring salespeople or hiring staff so that the staff understand who the customer is that they'll be working with. So when you're talking on the phone, when you're doing all these different things, it's really crucial you understand your customer. But it also helps to understand, you know, where to market, and where to re out, do your outreach, uh, because it's endless places you can spend your money uh, in, in digital media, especially and traditional. So advertising generally for B2B uh, is, is definitely tough. It's tough to really get, uh, you know, products is a bit easier than services, but it's tough because you're, if your audience is not huge, unless you're selling something that everybody wants, if you're Microsoft or something, sure. But if you're selling something that's fairly unique, I use, you know, rad torque, it's a torque wrench. It's for people who build trains and build bridges and, you know, it's, it's not a huge audience. And so, uh, companies like that, we generally say, you know what, uh, let's set up a proper search program, Google search, so that people can find you when they're looking for you, because you can't rely on search engine optimization, organic stuff. Uh, it can be quite expensive to get your company to rank organically, especially if your clients, you know, all of North America, and you're selling a product to, you know, people in a specific industry across North America. So you want to make sure when they, when they, those people, which isn't very often, type in the keywords that you think are important that you have an ad that pops up at the top of the feed. And it doesn't cost much even to reach across North America if your product is not searched that much. Some of our clients are spending just a few hundred bucks a month on Google ad uh, search words, uh, which really just helps that, that them be found when they need to be found. Your brand, uh, you know, we encourage especially product clients. Uh, and I talked earlier about retargeting or remarketing. So when somebody comes to your website or engages with your products on your site or on a landing page that you retarget them through uh, Facebook ads, you know, that pop up in, in those people's specific feeds or on websites they visit. You can do this all through Google and Facebook just by cookies that are on your, on your, uh, or sort of pixels that are on your website. Um, uh, so using, but also just brand, if you're a product that you think can reach a specific audience and you want to just put your brand ads on sites, sometimes you need to buy these sites individually, but Google has a great platform that you can target specific uh, branded websites for, uh, or sites that are really re reach your customer. So advertising can be very tricky in B2B marketing. And so it's really comes down to what you're selling and where your audience is. And if there, if there's enough of them, then you do it. But the basics is do search, get your retargeting set up and do some brand if, there, if you can justify it and you keep your costs down on your advertising. The power of automation, for example, just to show you an example, when you have a clear call to action in your ad, 
they fill out a form, they get, they, you get that information, then you send them into a sequence. Uh, open rates are huge, as I said, with text, 80 to 90% open rate. So as soon as somebody fills out a form, you say, hey, thanks for filling out this form. Can I set up an appointment? The goal in B2B generally is getting that appointment. It's having that conversation, getting somebody to trust you and get them in a meeting so you can convert them into a customer. Uh, we'd all love in B2B for it to be magical and sell stuff like that. We all know that most B2B still relies on a, a customer relationship that has to be a conversation. So if you get them into a sequence through, through automation, into an appointment setting situation, that is key. And so you set this process forward once they fill out a form uh, through your ads or, or through your website. Just going to check my time here because I don't want to go over. Uh, social media. Now, this we always get asked about. Oh, can you do our social media for us? Well, we go. Well, why? What What is your goal with your social media? Uh, I think we have to be careful in business to business marketing because it, it social media like doing content doesn't lead to a lot of conversions. Generally, even on your own social media page, uh, only about one percent of the people who follow you can see your content. They get fed your content in their feed. So it's 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 important to do it. Just again, going back to the beginning. We talked about your reputation. Social media is great for talking about your stuff. And so if people go to your web, to your social media channels, they'll see, oh, wow, these guys are great. Look at all the stuff they're doing. But the engage, it's really hard to get high engagement with most B2B social media on your own social media channels. But it's good to do, but don't, don't, it's not a priority in B2B. The priority is, so that's kind of a push your content out. But if you want to, if you want to really make social media, you got to pull people in. And, and that's why it's, you know, conversational. That's why social, social media. Uh, so LinkedIn, obviously for, for business to business is, is huge uh, and effective. They've just, as of the last month, uh, made it restricted into, you can only reach out to 100 people per week. Now, before it was pretty much unlimited through the paid sales navigator system. Now it's 100 per week. Uh, and so you, you're limited, but you know, 10 a day, if you can find 10 people a day on LinkedIn that you think are your ideal prospect, your perfect customer, uh, it, it's a very, very, uh, can be a very effective, um, tool for, for marketing the most, I think, effective tool for marketing on social for most, uh, business to business things. Cause you can start that relationship. You can have that, start that conversation. You reach out to somebody, uh, and you talk to them. Facebook, while it's, I say it's not great for content as far as pushing content out, it's great for finding the groups where your customers live. If you can get yourself embedded into a group a Facebook group that's, uh, that ha is the home of your ideal customer. So you just have to go in there. You have to fill out usually a form. Not all of them will let you in if they find out what you're trying to, that you're trying to sell, but you got to make sure that if you do get into these social media, uh, Facebook groups, uh, that you don't become obnoxious <laughs> and you don't try to start selling stuff and you don't ask people to marry you on the first date. Uh, that goes for all B2B marketing. Take your time. It's a slow process and, you don't tell you when you took your partner out first time you met him, you didn't ask them to marry you on the, on at the, at the first dinner you went to take your time, work, work, work with the, with the person and get them to a point where you can, uh, uh, you know, then eventually ask them to marry you, get that sale. But on Facebook groups, you can engage with people, look at questions they're asking. You can answer questions. You can put out questions that you're curious about. You can find, uh, you know, we have a client right now, a client base that uh, has a specific category and they have, they use this whole industry uses a specific software. And so what I've done, I'm now targeting the people who, the software group, because I know my people are in this group talking about the software and we understand the software. So we're now having a, I'm having conversations with people in this Facebook group about the software that my ideal customer uses, because I think, okay, I can bring in the mark, connect the marketing to the software that they use and build a relationship with this person. So that if they decide they want marketing, they might think of me first and they'll ask me that question. Hey, how does marketing connect to this software? And I will say, well, it's a good thing you ask because I know exactly how it connects to this software because we do it every day for our customers. Um, list building, as I said earlier, is, is really crucial, but in, and in Canada, it's so restrictive. Uh, you want to make sure that you have fantastic list. Never forget about the list you have. Retarget that list. Re, you know, re re-engage with those lists. Start sending them content. If you're not sending out a regular email, you're crazy. And you're actually the SMSing, the texting, uh, very effective. And so if you have people's uh, if you have people's uh, cell numbers, fantastic. Don't worry, they're not going to be mad if you're if you're having a proper conversation. It has to come from you personally. And there's a whole process behind this. And there's software that does this. 
but it's really a very effective way if you have a, an interesting offer or discussion to have with this person. Don't just say, hey, how's it going? Say, hey, you know, we have this thing that's really this offer that I thought you might be interested in. Would you like to know more about it? Sure, yes, no. Uh, yes, okay, then, oh, it's this, blah, blah, blah. You send them to an automated sequence until the point where they say, well, that's great. Let's book an appointment and talk more about it. Again, automation, CRM, content, pushing, reaching out to your customers, conversations. Uh, there's some great online tools that you can use to find leads that you can build your lists with. D7leadfinder.com and Seamless AI are, are two ones that I use. They're paid systems, but they're really great for finding the actual people uh, and, their, and their contact information. One of the parts of this process, you got to create that hello email sequence. So create the, what's that first thing going to say? What's the first offer? Uh, and then kind of roughly map out what the next five things would be. Uh, and if it gets into a manual process, this works on LinkedIn really well, this sort of five step sequence. Hi, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, George from Curve Communications. I see that you do this. I thought you might be want to connect. That's the first one. They say yes. Then you go, oh, great. Hey, then you start a conversation and then you get into the sales sequence at some point. Uh, and always remember anything you put out there, that there's a call to action. Always keep your calls to action, not obnoxiously, but put it in there. Anything you do, keep a call to action. And of course, your CRM needs content. You need to have lead magnets. You need to have an irresistible offer. Lead magnets are basically, you know, there's sort of, you know, white papers are an example, uh, listicles, uh, you know, um, sometimes just a, a version of your product that's, you know, a beta version or a smaller version of your, if it's software, that's not quite the full version. These are all lead magnets, get people into your list, sign up for this and get this. Sometimes it's free, sometimes it's paid. <clears throat> give them an irresist irresistible offer, uh, whether it's content or whether it's uh, something that you're that you usually sell, uh, and make give it real value. And even if they don't hire you after it, it's still helping you build your list and add to your CRM to remarket, remarket, remarket to, and build that list for the future. And as I said, in Canada, lists are gold because of our uh, spam laws. Uh, and then uh, make sure that you're talking again from their perspective, tie that up, offer to how their business will be benefit from this and always over deliver when you're doing this, always over deliver. The final one really is results. It's really about, you know, the beautiful thing with CRMs and automation. And, but I think all of you need to know that you always have to be tra tracking your marketing. We are obsessed with this as an agency. We have different ways of doing it depending on the client. The automation sometimes provides really some specific ways to do it. We often just use a Google Sheet uh, to leads to closes. You know, there's a, a cost per lead, really straightforward spreadsheet, but we can, it's, it's updated in real time. The client can see the ads came from, or this lead came from here. This is what happened to the lead. And, this, and then the clients, we ask them to fill in the final things and did it close. And then we have the lifetime value of a client is how we generally work. So what is the lifetime value LTV of your customer? Uh, and that's the number we work on. So if you're going to spend, if your client is worth $25,000, what are you willing to spend to get that $25,000 lifetime value? You know, so I would say that, you know, a thousand dollars to get a $25,000 client is probably a good investment on advertising or whatever it is you're doing. So always keep that in mind. Lifetime value for your in B2B is the key. Um, uh, tracking your data, ROAS is return on ad spend. ROI is return on investment. So that's sort of slightly different, but RO, your return on your ad spend is really important to track uh, because you want to make sure your ads are converting uh, and you want to make sure that all those things are clicking. And everything you do, you want to make sure it's scalable. So you test, 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 test. If it works at 10 bucks or it works at 20 bucks, it's probably going to work at 200 bucks or 400 bucks. And you reach the law of diminishing returns whenever that we get there. But if you know something works, you know, then it, at, at this price, at this cost, then it's going to work at 10 times that potentially. And so, but figure it out first at the lower cost and then scale it and then rinse and repeat. So once it's slightly, you see that stop working, you see the, the math starting to go against you on that campaign, then you have to always be prepared to move into the next campaign. Uh, and so that you can rinse and repeat that process. So you start with a test, scale it. And then you, while that one's doing great, you start testing another ad campaign or another process or another email system or another piece, whatever it might be, test, test, scale, and rinse and repeat these things. And that's how you'll see success. Um, so again, reputation, focus on that. Make sure everything's, all you, all, everything's looking great online, that people only see positive things about you. 
reach, do all the things that you need to do to reach out to your perfect ideal customer and track, track your results, data, all that stuff's really important. I know the accounting department loves that. Uh, but so does the CEO. And it really helps you justify your existence if you're a salesperson or a marketing person. And that is it. So if you want to get a free marketing audit, I am happy to uh, take a look at your website, make some recommendations. You just email me, george at curvecommunications.com, george at curvecommunications.com. If you want to know more or uh, pick my brain, uh, I can set up an appointment. We can have a chat. Uh, so feel free to email me and I will get you into my funnel <laughs> so I can sell to you. Uh, that's it. All right. Back to you, Paul. Thanks a lot, George. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> thanks again. Um, so just reminding everybody, if you've got any questions uh, that you'd like us to, to um, pose to George, please put them in the uh, in the chat room and I'll be dipping in and out of there from time to time. Uh, just a couple of things. And there were one or two things that, that I, I think we touched on briefly the last time you were with us, George, and I just wanted to kind of dive in to, to, to maybe a couple of them again. Um, avatars. Uh, I must say that got me thinking quite a bit when you mentioned that last time. Um, presumably, you could have multiple avatars for different client bases yep. and, and what have you. Is there something where you'd say, well, no, whoa, that's too many avatars you've got going on there? <laughs> or maybe you need to, to diversify and broaden the avatar base, so to speak. How, how, do, you, how do you suggest yeah. people go about it's setting that up? Start with one and then work your way up from there. Uh, yeah, so quite often... Um, Sometimes it might be gender specific or it might be uh, specific industries, but generally uh, to scale, it's always better to niche uh, and figuring out your avatar is always requ kind of requires you to kind of figure out, okay, who, uh, you know, if I'm selling this, who is my ideal customer? So if I use Rad Torque, it's this torque wrench company. They sell to the train industry, they sell to bridges, they sell to oil and gas, they sell to. So we have to sit there and go, but those are kind of different industries but there are some similarities to the to the audience we had a client another client actually a better example would be we had a client we did a discovery process with them and they thought their avatar was the ceo of the company and once we did some analysis we discovered it was the vp of operations and those people live in different worlds they the, the ceo of a multinational he hangs out at expensive country clubs whereas the vp of operations he's at the you know he's down wherever he's probably hanging out with his kids he's probably 10 years younger it changes everything about how you reach these customers. So that's more what it's about. It's, you can create more than one, but you have to also go, how much money do I have and how much time do I have? It's better to say one or two or maybe three max to say, okay, these are, these are our customers and that all we're going to do is focus on these because unless, because there's, there's, I'm sure there's so many of them out there that, have, you know, you want to get more of them. If you just kind of, you're not going to, you're not, your sales won't get where you need to go. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at some of the folks who are, who are on the, the call today and I can see some people who, would probably be thinking to themselves, well, actually, the products that I sell or the services that I provide, I mean, there's almost no end of business prospects that, that might be out there. So the temptation would, I suspect, be, well, let's go for, you know, we, we, we can help big business, we can help small business, we can help yep. this sector, this sector. It, it depends. I mean, if you're, if you're geographically specific, then you maybe can be more broad. But if you are trying to reach everybody, you know, the whole province, um, it's going to be tough to find a way to reach that uh enough people uh, because repetition is key in advertising and marketing you know you want to make sure so for example if you're advertising on uh facebook in the old days and paul you used to work in print media way back and and you know the magical number was seven to ten times for an ad to really connect into a person's brain now with digital media that number has gone to 40 to 50 times that that person has to see your ad before it connects so we're talking about five times so while digital media might be sharp cheaper uh, you have to actually person have to see it more often than they used to, uh, just the nature of the beast. So you, if you have, and so if you have a limit, unlimited amount of money, then great, fine, go for it. But that doesn't seem logical to me. I would say that you need to make sure you focus on one avatar, perfect the process and the conversions for that avatar, uh, that persona, uh, everything's got to fit into it, whether it's the, the white paper that you create for them or whatever the offer is, whatever, you know, the ad design looks like the colors, all this stuff matters. And so if you have too many avatars, it's too much, too much for your marketing person or your marketing agency to figure out and, and you end up failing. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's talk about something. There was a, a bit of conversation uh, that I have with a number of different people after, after you were last with us talking about text marketing. And, and I know you've said, and I've heard it from, from others that, that the open rates are, are hugely 
uh, greater than, than other forms of communication. Um, but I also have people say, hang on a minute, I don't really want, you know, my text, it's, it's my phone. It feels a bit more personal. I'm not sure if I want to be bothered in the same way as, as I'm okay with my business email. What, what, what thoughts do you have that people might want to look at in terms of perhaps the type of messaging, the, the frequency, yeah. et cetera? I would say on a reactivation campaign. So if you're reaching out to old customer base, uh, you know, I can see that's generally where we get pushed back from our B2B clients. They think, oh, I don't know. I don't, they've never received a text from me before. Um, but if it's coming to say, Hey, it's Paul from the Burning Board of Trade. I got this event coming up. I thought, you know, uh, you, you'd be interested in this because it's really cool. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. You know, that's why wouldn't I want that? Uh, I know who you are, you know, why wouldn't I want to get a text from you? But if you're uncomfortable with that, and I totally get that, then at least make sure that your forms on your website that people fill out, or there's a, there's a chat section on your website that you switch it to SMS texting, as opposed to emailing, you can do both simultaneously. But if you can get a text immediately, even if it's manually, if you're not for your one person operation, uh, and you're doing B2B, set up your text system on your website and get it going and make sure your forms are sending you a text. Uh, because if you can immediately send somebody back a text saying, Hey, thanks very much for filling up this form. Well, how can I help you? I mean, the person's just going to be blown away. It, it, it's so easy to set up and it's, it's an email is great, but this, this is a window of opportunity. That's not going to last long. I think this SMS texting process and it's not, and it's probably based on regulations. You have to be careful. You can't send out thousands and thousands of texts today. Never send out more than 20 or 30 if you're going to automate it or maybe 100 if you have a list that big. But we're seeing, you know, if a, like if a client this is more B2C as a list of 300, we're booking, we're seeing an open rate of 80 percent. And we're seeing, uh, you know, booking appointments at, uh, you know, about five to 10 percent uh for direct to appointment so it's it's free money it doesn't cost you anything and yeah. you're re-engaging with your customers especially if you're a software company and you're upgrading or you've got new stuff and you want to let them know why wouldn't they want to know yeah no fair, fair point and, and a couple of things just further before we move away from text um in terms of how you might recommend sms integration in a form any thoughts on that well, it requires a bit of software finagling. Um, so you have to kind of get, there's various softwares out there that you have to sign up for. And there's a bit of a cost to the, to the texting uh, itself. But most forms like WordPress forms, generally there's an app on WordPress or there's different platforms that you can use. If you just simply Google, uh, you know, or just email me and I'll send you a couple that we use. Um, they, they, there are lots of ones out there. Um, you just want to make sure you, you sign up to a legit one and, it's really about not being obnoxious, though. Yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming just from a technical point of view, the um, uh, the rules around uh, texting people, uh, as far as Castle is concerned, are the same as email and... Yeah, it's a bit easier. If it's a customer, uh, yeah, the spam laws are <clears throat> same regulation, so double opt-in. But <clears throat> the general rule with... Uh, with, um, so I'm assuming that you've got double opt-in for the list you have. And so that they're okay. And you can send, once you have double opt-in, you can send them anything you want. Uh, for new customers though, if somebody sends you a, a, a form, well, they're having a conversation with you. So, so the castle regulations are fairly okay with that. As long as you're, as long as you're responding to their first response to you. So that's why forms are so great because they're the ones starting the conversation. You're not reaching out to them. They're actually contacting you about asking you a question. So you're responsible to answer that question. Uh, and that's all good. Yeah. So then it comes down to, and you spent a bit of time talking about this, but just to elaborate, um, building lists of, pot of potential customers. Um, yep. You mentioned a couple of, of sources or resources for, for, yep. for your folks to do that. Um, maybe you could just elaborate a little bit on, on, where you've had the most success? Well, L7, I think is what L7 Lead Finder uh, is really good. It's quite cheap. Uh, the other one's a little more expensive. Um, Automate.ai, I think it's it was. Um, the, it's really, it works better for US if you're reaching out into US for sure. But it does work. If you're trying to find the right person within a company and they, you know, you go to their website and they not, they're hiding everything or you just want to know more information, you find them on LinkedIn, but you kind of want to, do a bit more intel or it, the, the, you can actually build up pretty good lists. So if you're marketing America, which doesn't have the same spam laws, uh, go to town, build these lists and emailing still works. You can still mass email. California is getting strict, uh, getting similar to Canada on. So be careful in California, but generally U S is pretty wide open if you're marketing into the U S. So 
Um, and I would suggest that uh, any business that's now has any kind of virtual bat based in the last year, you should start looking at how do you expand into the US because it's 10 times more people and 10 times more businesses. And if your focus is, you know, small business to small business, like business to business, it's there's 35 million small businesses in America. Uh, so if you're selling something to small business, it's like gold. So that's where I'm focused on right now is the US. Yeah, yeah. Um, on, the, on the social media front, on, and, and obviously, I think we all understand that you know the different social media platforms serve different purposes, and different kinds of messages work better or worse on on the on the different platforms. But LinkedIn is where you kind of seemed, if I got it right, seemed to land as being on a business to business front, yeah. as good a place as any to, to kind of start. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on? The type of messaging you might want to send to somebody out of the blue or because you go on LinkedIn, you think, well, here's somebody who would be ideal for us. But, and you mentioned a five stage progression of messaging. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, it depends on what you're selling. But generally, I try to write a five step email sequence that I then use cut down into a into a LinkedIn sequence. Um, obviously, the first one is, you know, it's hi, how are you? And here's why I want to connect with you. And you hope that they um will say yes and as soon as they say yes that's a that's a that's a raised hand to interest in you so that's a that's hugely valuable if you're in sales and then it's really about you know uh generally i try to look at how i can solve their problem so i'll i'll i do this manually on linkedin i don't do any automation there are other people that i don't think it's it's just risky i think you'll get you get you could get shut down and stuff so I, my process is 10 people a day you know, doing manual outreach. And I have a kind of structure. I've written these things, but it might be like, but I'll also do some, I'll look at their website and I'll say, oh, okay, they're not doing, they don't have um, the Facebook pixels on their website. They're not doing remarketing. They're not doing, for my purposes, I know what I'm selling. So I'm looking for the things that they're not doing and say, hey, I noticed uh, on your website, you might want to just put this into your website. No charge. <laughs> it's like just a little tip for you. Here's a link to how to do it. Stuff like that, that just, you know, you're having a conversation, you're giving them tips, giving them free information. Uh, same for those conversations on Facebook groups. You're going on there, looking, you're just mind looking around, seeing what people are talking about, and you say, "Oh, somebody asked a question. Does anybody, you know, know how to connect to this marketing to this software?" And so I'll go, "Yeah, I do. Uh, you do this and this and this." And they're like, "Wow, thanks." And then they try to do it and they can't. They're like, "Oh, can you help me?" Yes, I will charge you for that. Right. So, <laughs> and following up on that, um, Ron has just asked a question again about the, the LinkedIn. That first, because mm -hmm. I guess the first one is. Uh, it is almost as, as I say, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, and 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 so that first message that you send out has got to kind of be spot on. Um, do's and don'ts on that. Yeah, I, it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'm glad that LinkedIn actually has put a stop to this massive amount of because uh, it was getting crazy there for a while. Um, you know, I, so they've limited it to 100, which is better because my inbox is getting full of people who I like. Who are these people? Why do they even want to be friends? Uh, I tend to be pretty loose when it comes to LinkedIn for receiving friends. I just go, yeah, 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 okay. Unless they don't have a, a picture, then I'm like, no. Um, but generally, I'm like, all right, you want to be friends with me? Sure. Because, hey, it's a, you know, I never know when I might want to reach out to you. Um, so, but generally, people are pretty friendly on LinkedIn. I find some are slower than others. Depends, again, on your, on your avatar. Uh, but people tend to be on there. And if you seem like you'll be able to add value to their business, then... You know, so it's really focusing on that. So, it's, you know, hey, you know, uh, I, so and so, and this is, we do this. And I thought th there's a, obviously a connection between what I do and what you do. Thought you might be interested. It's as simple as that. Uh, and if they don't think so, then that's that's their loss. There's more of them out there. Yeah. It's a volume. It's a, it's sales. It's a volume game. So, you know. Well, it's, it's it's interesting right you there. mentioned that point earlier, you know, that, 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 that I've, I've often said, you know, if, if a salesperson makes 20 calls a day and makes, one sale out of that. Well, try to get yourself in a position to make the forty a day, and you'll get a couple of sales. And exactly the same thing you were mentioning yeah. earlier with, with you know, the, the 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 either the lead generation or the other CRM tactics that you were mentioning. Yeah, and then that's where I, I talked about the revenue team, the sales and marketing team, quite often. And we often have this battle, and the client will sometimes say, "Oh, our leads are crappy," and then you know we'll say, "Well, what are you doing?" How, you know, we we try to get involved in that sales process a little bit to see why i mean is it the conversation you're having or are you need to know are our leads crappy and, and quite often it's just the salesperson's not getting back fast enough or they're discounting they're making a judgment call before they even pick up the phone or whatever so you got to make sure that you're open and that there's a and that you're you know but you're always going to get junky leads facebook is the worst you get so much so with facebook for example for business to business marketing we do a process now because i'm all shocked people will fill out a form on facebook 
for a product or something. And then they'll go, I, I, and you, you'll respond to them and going, uh, I did, I filled out a form. You're like, oh my God, how do you not remember filling out this form? And so what we do now is we, the forms, we usually send them either to a detailed form and they have to tick certain boxes and we know, you know, are you a certain size company or whatever it might be? You kind of get rid of the junk. And then we, then we put them into a text sequence uh, to really nurture them. So nurturing is where the texting comes in because then you can have this automated conversation, ask them a few key questions and then get them to an appointment. But if they don't say, so it's like, if this, then that. So if it's yes to this question, they go this way. If it's no, then they go that way. So in the case of curve, we have one that it'll be like, yes, I, I'm interested. Okay. Now you're going this funnel. If they, if they don't meet this certain, for example, we have one where it's a, if you don't have a list of more than 500 people, then we send you off. That's one of the questions we ask. Then you go off into this other thing where you get a video of me talking about something. And then I, and then I send them a free book and I say, here's how you can build up your list. But if you want to build up your list right away, you can start advertising and you can hire us to help you do advertising, but you don't have a big enough list for this stuff, but you can do this. So. Yeah. And Mario was just asking any, any thoughts on LinkedIn ads. Yeah, we don't do them at all. Do's or don'ts. Sorry. Now nah. we're doing one campaign right now for a, a company in blockchain world. Um, but generally we have not seen the conversions on Facebook or on Google on LinkedIn ads uh, for B2B. It's a, uh, our, our recommendation is put that money and energy into mining and talking to people. Uh, and, you know, you know, even if it's hiring somebody to do that for you, instead of spending that money on ads, it's expensive. It's complicated too. It's not the, it's not the funnest platform to use. So I wouldn't recommend it um, uh, as a, as a, as a, as, as a first place. I mean, I would start with Google and retargeting and brand and retargeting on Facebook. Uh, and then eventually LinkedIn will get it figured out, but right now they're still kind of a mess, I think. Yeah. Back to the reputation thing. We just got time for another quick, quick mm -hmm. conversation, please. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, reputation you mentioned at the beginning. Um, sometimes you get a bad Google review, and sometimes it genuinely is a bad review because of an experience that, that took place. And sometimes it doesn't seem that it is. Um, it just seems like something that's been put up there. Anything you can do about that kind of thing? Nope. I've tried in Google. This could care less. There's like the you know the bots at Google and Facebook are pretty powerful now. The only thing you generally we can do, you can try, you simply file complaints. And I've got this one on my our, our review. Anonymous is the person's name. Anonymous. Really? Come on. And so one star review has nothing else in there. And of course, it's like, I don't know who this person is. They're, they're not a client. They're, it's not a real review. It's somebody who either hated me or I don't know. But I can't. And I've tried and tried. Nothing. So the only thing you can do is get more positive reviews. And we have a process now that, uh, that we offer a software for clients that uh, you can automate the process a bit and guarantee only positive reviews for your, for your website, for your, for your company. And so just, but really, so it's sending an email to your pat, always get your customers to review you, but try to make sure it's only customers that will give you a positive four, star, four to five star review. And you can tell your customers that, can you please give me a five star? You know, don't, don't give me a three star, please. Um, yeah. But generally we have a process that, uh, that we use it for our clients that stops that happening anyways, but you just got to get more reviews to get, it doesn't take very many to get it out of the dumps generally. Good, thanks. Thanks. We've, we've got a couple of minutes left, so we've got a couple of quick yeah. questions. Um, sure. Was there a plugin uh, for chat or forms for text notification? Is there a plugin that's easily, or well, presumably there are, but easily available? It depends on, again, that's why you need a basic CRM uh, to make it work. Uh, so there are lots out there. Um, and we have one that we use, which is Sharp Spring, but we also use another one. Uh, we have several that we use. Um, it's a question of how much money you have, but there are some basic, basic ones you can get um, that will work uh, if it's just that you're doing. Um, but it's a good investment to get into a CRM and get your systems built um, uh, early on and look at trying to budget that couple of hundred bucks or whatever it might be a month. But there are many, many, if you go, if you're a WordPress site, there's probably a ton of them that you could find, but it's generally the cost of the actual telephone numbers and the text you have to pay for the actual it's the pennies though it's pennies per text like literally like less like a tenth of a penny per text there's a question around what kind of investment um do, 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 do we suggest for a typical b2b business to, to to do as much of it all of it ideally but as much of it as really gets them moving in the right direction and how do you just to add on to that how do you kind of set and then manage expectations for a business where this is not an area of expertise for them 
Well, if you're asking about marketing in general, you should always be budgeting around 10% of your budget for, for marketing. Uh, and that can be a bunch of different things. And then you prioritize those things, uh, what they should be out of the gate. And that could include your CRM. So uh, if you're not marketing your business, then I don't know why you're in business. Um, so uh, every business is different, but I would say priority wise, you know, start with that CRM, start with the low hanging fruit of clients that you know, that will be out there, do the manual outreach, get them into these funnels, get them the content, get them stuff that builds that relationship. Imagine a world that we'll have without trade shows, without being able to connect. We're getting those back, but if we can build a world that also can live without the trade shows, then you should try and do that. And that requires some basic investment, um, and then, um, you know, buying ads, but generally in B2B, uh, advertising, you know, it's, it's really about relationships. And so you, the, the manual approaches and committing to like literally half an hour every morning to LinkedIn, you'll see massive growth in your, in your B2B, just, just do just doing that. Um, if I was a business that didn't have any budget, uh, and I was marketing to other businesses, I would just spend uh, you know, at least an hour a day on LinkedIn talking to people and, and you'll see conversions. <clears throat> Thanks, thanks. And one last question, and I guess this talks then about the, um, I think this is a question around the avatar. Um, uh, quick question of the conversation I made earlier about how to, tips on developing an individual brand for a business development managers. Uh, Assuming sure that's understand. avatar related question. Uh, well, I think that the business development managers, and that's a, it's always an interesting, are they a salesperson or are they a marketer or are they, uh, are they a schmoozer? I don't know. It depends on their, on their personality. I think, I mean, I think any business to business, uh, if you don't have somebody who's willing to pick up the phone and make calls and you're in trouble, uh, yeah. that's always the ultimate test. I don't know, Paul, you've worked from the world long enough to know that it's amazing how many salespeople hate picking up the phone. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it linked in and phone calling can't beat it for business to business. It's, it's really about talking to people and you can't, as I said earlier, you can't convert, I mean, this, you might have some business that's magical and, and business and people are buying your product without any conversation. That's great. That's great. So then ramp it up and buy the ads. But if you're not, and it relies on relationships, uh, you got to get these people on the phone. You have to, you have to have a car or zoom or whatever it might be phone being, you know, whatever technology you prefer, but you got to have that conversation with people to, con to close them. They have to trust you or your sales rep. So business development to me is, I don't know what that means to be honest. I, I, I it's it a marketing person or is it a salesperson? It could be both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, George. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Again today. That, that was great. Thank you.